The current heat wave in India and Pakistan sets the scene for this Climate Gen episode, speaking with Climate Crisis Advisory Group Chair Professor Sir David King about their new report on what we must do to have the best chance of averting climate and ecological collapse. Sir David makes it very clear that nobody will escape these impacts as the climate emergency worsens and what we are seeing in India continues to spread around the world. Sir David emphasises the need for solidarity and pulling together to meet the challenges at the global level. He also highlights that wealthier countries must pay up on adaptation costs for vulnerable and poorer nations. As someone with first-hand experience of the climate negotiations, Sir David points the fingers at the United States for its lack of global leadership on appropriate climate action at the political level. Activism around the world is stepping up as people realise the failures of governments to take appropriate action. Even the UN Secretary General is calling out the failures of world leaders, declaring that activists are rational actors compared to those entrusted with power. Thank you for listening to Climate Gen. To get episodes early as well as unpublished archive material, you can support the channel via Patreon or become a member on YouTube. You can also subscribe for free on YouTube or on all major podcast channels. Thank you. Hey, so Dave, it's good to see you again. I want to start with an event that's very obvious and it's um, the heat wave in India and Pakistan that we're seeing now. And it's something that I think you've been warning about, but is it a taster of what's to come? And can we respond in time now to prevent the worsening of things like this, these kinds of events? Well, you're asking two very big questions there, and they are very important. What, what we see in this heat wave is temperatures approaching 50 degrees centigrade, and we're not at midsummer yet. And we're several months away from the monsoon that will cool the area down. And the biggest worry has got to be that people living in an area where the humidity is reasonably high, I believe it's mainly over 50% there, and the temperatures are about 45 to 50 degrees centigrade, it's unlikely that people can survive without air conditioning for, for much time at all. So I think we have to anticipate uh, a potential very high death rate in this area. I mean, th this is the kind of disaster that uh, is foreseen under the climate change actions and reports, but it's something that is avoided by, by many people who are concerned about climate change, but don't want to scare people. So I, I think the exception is uh, Tim Stanley Robinson, whose wonderful novel, The Future, uh, sets out uh, in 2026 with a heat wave of exactly this kind in northern India and around 1 million people dying. So it's, it's, um, it's a, a very, very serious issue. And uh, is it likely to continue? Is it likely to get worse? Is it likely that it will spread in, uh, into other parts of the world? Absolutely, I'm afraid. So the biggest challenges from climate change are temperature rise, and the second biggest challenge, of course, is sea level rise. And the two are related because ice on land melts. So the second point about what is happening in northern India is the acceleration of the loss of ice from the Himalayas. And this is very, very serious because those of you who've read this about what is happening in Pakistan and India will know that, that a big ice lake has broken and has caused a, a massive bridge to fail and so on. The real problem is the loss of ice. We know that ice on land across the world is now melting irreversibly. And if all of the ice on the Himalayas melts, or even a significant fraction, and the ice on Greenland, and ice lost on Antarctica, we're talking about sea level rises this century, which could exceed two to three meters and the map of the world will change dramatically. So I think there are really critically important issues that we all need to learn from what is happening in, in India and Pakistan. So I take you on to the second question, second question you asked me, and can there be anything done about this? We are in many ways extremely short of time now. And so I just have to say this, what we do over the next few years is going to determine the future of humanity. It's as, as critical as that. When I say few years, 
everything we put in place over the next five to 10 years is likely to determine the future of humanity. And I say that because when all the ice has melted, or even a large fraction of the ice has melted, we're talking about a sea level rise of five to 10 meters. We're talking about temperature rises, which could be uh, five to eight degrees centigrade. So the, the, the world as we know it will be very different. And there's no way in which we can imagine humanity, the civilization that has built up over the last 6,000 years, will continue in that situation. What can we do? The Climate Crisis Advisory Group has put forward a program, a three-point program, each beginning with an R. And the three R's are, first of all, reduce emissions deeply, rapidly, and in a just and orderly fashion. Every ton of carbon dioxide we emit now is going to have to be removed. So we are already in debt in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. That's why what is happening in, in northern India and Pakistan is happening. That is why we are losing ice in Greenland irreversibly. So as we, as we move forward in time, we know that every tonne of greenhouse gases we emit is added to the excess that's already in the atmosphere. All of that has to be removed. But we can't do it overnight, and we must do it in an orderly fashion. And so the first and, and most important thing at the moment is to do that, to remove the greenhouse gases deeply, rapidly, and in an orderly and just fashion. What, what is needed there is a combination of countries working together, hopefully through the United Nations. I believe there should be a sort of Security Council for Climate Change set up under the United Nations, representing all countries who can coordinate activity across nations. We can't be working separately on this problem. And the wealthy nations have to take the burden of reducing emissions deeply and rapidly, and then bring along the developing nations and the least developed countries by helping to finance the transition there and to finance adaptation. And that then brings me to the second part of the program. The, the second R is remove excess greenhouse gases at scale. Today, if we include methane, and for goodness sake, we must include methane, it's a big contributor to our temperature rise. It's over 500 parts per million. It's not 415, that's just carbon dioxide. We need to get the total down to 350 parts per million or less to really guarantee a future for humanity beyond the coming 50 to 100 years. And then thirdly, what do we do about the fact that the Greenland ice is beginning to melt? How do we check that melting process in the process of it happening? And the answer is, look at the cause of the Greenland ice melting, and that is the loss of ice over the Arctic Ocean. And so moving forward, it means that we have to learn how to keep the ice cover that is formed over the Arctic Ocean during the winter in place during the three polar summer months. And here at the Centre for Climate Repair in Cambridge, we are working on a procedure for that, marine cloud brightening. We're also working on a procedure for removal of greenhouse gases at scale, and we're aiming to see if we can remove 10 to 15 billion tonnes a year. Compare that with the current emissions rate of 40 billion tonnes a year. So the answer to your question is, it needs us all to pull together on this mission to create a manageable future for humanity. You touched there on the need for working together and not working separately. Um, currently, we do have this COP process. We're coming up, well, not coming up, but we're sort of between the posts at the moment as we move towards COP27. Um, Bloomberg Green reported that at COP27, Egypt is teaming up with COP28 hosts to frame oil as part of the solution for climate change. And there's a sentiment that they should be able to benefit from the monetization of resources to help develop their countries. And in terms of equity, it's quite hard to disagree with that, especially when you see what we've benefited. Um, how do we get round it within planetary boundaries? Because also, I mean, talk about India, 
Modi has said that developed nations should be giving India a, a trillion dollars to accelerate the decarbonization. Um, he's probably right. He's probably right. But yeah, what what are your, your thoughts on those? Well, you know, let me just take that last point. A trillion dollars, and yet in two thousand and nine, the developed world promised through the COP process a hundred billion dollars a year going towards the uh, developing countries to aid them in this process of adaptation and reducing emissions. The total sum that we have uh, made available through the, say, all uh, uh, groups that is managing the fund is $22 billion a year, counting only public money, which is what was talked about in 2009. Any other figure, which is often quoted up to 90 billion, includes funds that are going in as aid projects and not, not necessarily all aimed at dealing with climate change. So we, we have, we, the developed world, have not delivered. There's a real lack of trust, and that's the background to Modi's well-placed comment about a trillion dollars. He's not saying in a year. I think he's talking about the next 15, 20 years. And it is a reasonable request. And then there's the rest of the world. And so I think we are really up against it. But are we able to afford it? No question. We can't afford not to. I mean, the, the alternative is we come back to what is now happening in India and Pakistan and how it's going to spread around the world. There is no country that is going to feel unaltered by the climate change events. So I, I think it not just behoves us all to work together on this. It's necessary. It's necessary for our human survival. I have a granddaughter who's two and a half years old, and almost certainly she would expect to live to at least to the end of the century. Will she be able to look at her children if she has children at that point and say they will live to the end of the next century? Not at the moment. So we, we are very good at looking back on our history through six to 8,000 years, but we have no chance of looking forward at anything like that timeline. So I, I, I think I'm wandering away from your question, but I, the main point is we can afford it. The wealthy nations have the funds. The wealthy nations need to understand the, the importance of working together on this with the less developed nations, with the even the rapidly emerging economies like India and China. We all need to be pulling together on this because we're all effectively in the same boat. But that is, at the moment, I'm afraid, a very big ask. Now, I, I believe, and I'm only working on this, that we have to believe we can do it. Right? We have to believe we can do it because otherwise we just give up. And frankly, that's, uh, that's not a way. Okay. And... The report mentions governance, and it's that's pretty much what you've been talking about just now, really. And governance in a very rational way that can improve our responses and our outcomes is, is ultimately what we need in terms of leadership and everything else. Is there a realistic way to implement these changes in, in what is pretty much an irrational reality at the moment. I mean, wherever we look, we're, we're confronted with it. There's a very big problem, which is the power of the lobby system, particularly in the United States. And I'm just going to refer to the, the cigarette lobby. I'm going to refer to the gun lobby. These lobbies are so powerful that the majority view of the people in the United States is ignored by senators and congressmen who enough of them are in the pockets of these lobbyists. I've spent six months working in, in Washington, D.C. and was simply amazed to find the number of lobbyists in, in that city and the way they make a living by persuading, and there's financial backing to this, persuading senators and congress not to vote for it. Now, if the United Nations, and we all believe the United Nations is the critical body, were to go down the route that I'm suggesting, 
The fear is that the United States will simply back off from the United Nations. And since they are the biggest funder of the United Nations, this is pretty well disastrous. I cannot see the Secretary General of the United Nations leading away in that direction, at least at the moment. I know Guterres well enough, I've talked to him in, at some length about climate change, to know that he is totally committed in the same way as I am to actions needed to stem this crisis. But he can't afford to do that in, in a very real sense. He makes outstandingly good speeches. But going beyond that to do what is necessary is quite possibly beyond him. Now, how do we change that? We have to see that the lobbyists are put in their place. And the only way to put the lobbyists in their place is to emphasize that what is happening today in Pakistan and India is going to spread around the world. Nobody, nobody is going to escape from the consequences of this. We really have to sit on these climate skeptics who have no, no respect for the truth represented by science. It's a, it's a very, very difficult road, but we have to go down that road. And I seem to be pointing the finger at the United States. My negotiations from representing the British government in the climate negotiations with countries around the world, what was actually the most difficult country was the United States throughout all that period. One glimmer of light in Obama's second period when we, the rest of the world, found a way to let him vote on action to, to support the, uh, uh, the Paris Agreement, and that was by making all the commitments voluntary. If the United States was to bow to a commitment made by the United Nations together and say, yes, we will do what we're told to do, that would have had to go through Senate and Congress, no majority there. So. I, I think what I'm saying is this is, is influencing the whole world because, frankly, without the United States leadership, it's extremely difficult to see how we manage this problem. With the United States leadership in place, and Biden hasn't been able to do that for the same reasons I'm giving you now, with the United States leadership in place, we could manage this problem. I really believe that. Well, given where we are and that it, I mean, it's, it's everything socially divided. We're an unbalanced world. There's, we're not mitigating the further warming or preventing the loss of life. You cited Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future. But in his book, terrorism, the sort of activism, terrorism plays a key role in achieving those aims. Uh, you know, do you think activism has to raise its game in something, and I don't mean to terrorism, but I mean um, that kind of the public response. I, I mean, this is a very difficult one for me. I've worked in government for a long time, and obviously we're we're, we're not in favour. We're in favour of democratic decision making. However, when uh, Extinction Rebellion a group of them were being taken to court. You will remember the uh, the way in which they were blocking rail traffic on the underground, for example, by gluing themselves to the roof, to the outside roof of the coaches in, in unbelievable. I've talked to one of the women who did that, a lovely middle-class woman with children. Can you imagine putting your life at risk in that way? And so I agreed to, to go to defend them in court, and they were all let off. Um, and I, I mean, the defense is very simple. Quite simply, governments around the world should be following the best possible path for the future of their populations. I'm very pleased to note that the, the Dutch government gave way to the court decision led by a case taken by a tiny NGO, a very underrepresented NGO. But the clarity of their case was, government, your predecessors made promises in Paris that you're not delivering on. And the government had to turn around. So I, I do think the kind of protest that uh, that is fruitful in its actions is valid. Kim Stanley Robinson, 
refers to the fact that in a way the Indian government acted against international principles by by sending jet aircraft into the upper atmosphere to try to uh, reflect sunlight away from the region of India by putting sulfates up into the stratosphere. That, that sort of behavior becomes very rational. If you're trying to protect your population by cooling India, and all of the concerns about putting sulfates into the stratosphere in India suddenly evaporate. Now, of course, the United Nations didn't give them the go ahead, but nevertheless, they, they went ahead and did that. So yes, protest is, is one way to deal with it, but it's by far not the best way. I think the, I don't think we can give up on the processes that are currently in place. And as we develop, and here, here in Cambridge, we're working on processes that mimic nature, biomimicry. And we're doing this because we believe nature, if we look into the past, has provided so many brilliant solutions. So if we, if we do that, we, we can, I believe, create a sustainable future for humanity. And I, I think, I mean, one of our most recent and yet rapidly forming project with a, a consortium of five different research groups around the world is mimicking the behavior of whales in the ocean, right? Where, where we have learned that whales that feed on krill 300 to 500 meters below the sea level, where the krill populate in big swarms, um, they come up for air. We knew that for a long time, and we thought they, they had a biological pumping action in bringing fertile material up to the sunlit surface of the ocean. They do more than that. They also excrete when they get up to the surface of the ocean because of the high pressure of the water on their, on, on their orifice. And so they bring fertile material up in, in the form of their excretion. The feces in sunlight produces a mass of green phytoplankton and very quickly a forest which has billions of fish right so we're, we're talking about a process which if we can mimic we could possibly capture vast amounts of carbon dioxide but more than that repopulate the oceans with fish with crustaceans and with mammals right so i, I think there are promising ways forward once we can prove these, I think the, the world will begin to sit up and say, for goodness sake, let's get on and do these things and do them rapidly. That's a very something to aspire to. I mean, that's regenerating the oceans. And when you put something like that, which is a game changer on a number of levels, and then you put it in the context of all these other bad things that we've just discussed, I mean, simply paying a trillion dollars to India over any time scale doesn't seem reasonable at the moment because our governments just don't seem to have the capacity. And then I just wanted to touch on one more idea in um, Kim Stanley Robinson's book, which was the global reward coin. And I thought that this is interesting and it comes from Delson Chen's um, sort of ideas and papers or whatever. And it does seem that this could be a way of plugging that gap of kind of covering the mitigation costs. Have you had any thoughts on that? Have you, have you looked at it outside of the book context? Yes, I mean, I, I think, I think it's, it is an idea that comes really from Bitcoin. And I, I'm not a great fan of Bitcoin. Um, we, we, we're seeing investment in something, again, on a trillion dollar scale that has no, uh, no social value whatsoever. Um, however, Kim Stanley Robinson's proposal creates this into a social valuable, socially valuable uh, enterprise. So I think it is a very good idea. And because Bitcoin has taken up at such a level, wouldn't it be wonderful if this took over the entire market of Bitcoin? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, good place to end on. So th thank you very much. It's been good to hear how everything's progressing. We'll speak to you again soon. Always good to speak to you, Nick. Thank you so much.
Thanks again for listening. If you are interested to help support this series and help expand the discussion around climate topics, then please do consider backing my channel via Patreon. It will help me produce more content and you will also gain access to more expert interviews. It would be great to engage more with audiences too and understand your views on these topics.